turning on the lights. Scratching an itch. A pint of milk. Fancy footwear. A festival of yes. 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 Running nowhere, nowhere, nowhere. Goes down, goes down, goes down, up, down, up, up. A crunchy cup of coffee. Cup of coffee. Square marbles.
Falling ahead. A hot cup of tea. Taking my fish for a walk. Scratching an itch. A pint of milk. Live without expectations. Life in the 21st century is inundated with sounds that have no tangible source. Anytime you press play on Spotify, watch a movie, play a video game, or just take a walk in nature. We accept sound without origin all the time, but when it happens in the concert hall, we often fail to appreciate it in the same way. 
Music with electronics asks you to experience music that you can't see. Sounds with no source, and sometimes sounds that simply can't exist. And that makes us really uncomfortable. In classical music, we have this greater expectation of what a concert program will sound like. When you see an instrument on stage or a set of instruments, you form an idea about what type of music you're about to hear. When you press play on YouTube or open up Spotify, anything can come out. But in the concert hall, you know what it's going to be already. The act of seeing one French horn on stage today means you've already created an idea of what to expect from this concert. Dissolve it. Today's program will feature five works for horn and fixed or live electronics. My goal is to convince you that despite your expectations, electronic music is not nearly as involved or as scary as you may think. In fact, sometimes it's as simple as pressing play.
piece you just heard was James Nigus's Visions, which was commissioned by a consortium in 2021 as a concerto that could be performed while being socially distant during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. The piece is written for horn and fixed media, meaning the accompaniment is a predetermined audio track. In fixed media, there are two types of sounds that can be sourced to create the accompaniment. Those are found sounds and generated sounds. Found sounds are real world acoustical events that have been captured via a recording device and are then given back to you either in their raw format or through several different processes of alterations. Found sounds were formerly referred to as music concrete, and this also includes the genre of field recordings when audio technicians go out into the world and record things like babbling brooks or footsteps in the snow and things of that nature. In their infancy, these sounds were recorded via cassette tape and the physical tapes were then cut, glued together, run over sandpaper, put near magnets and any other manner of manual distortion to get the final product that you hear. Nowadays, these effects are generated using digital audio workstations, comfortably known as DAWs. You might be familiar with a few, such as Audacity or Adobe Audition. If you're a Yale student, you get that one for free. Please use it. The second type of sound that can be used in the creation of a fixed media accompaniment is a generated sound. A generated sound is 100% digital in origin and is created via software, through a synthesizer, or any other electric medium. Generated sounds can be created to imitate or mimic real world sounds, but also include sounds that exist solely in the digital plane. The following work, Holly Winter's A Call to Hunt, uses both found and generated sounds, sourcing many of its patches from field recordings made during the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests in Portland, Oregon. This is Holly Winter's A Call to Hunt,
would never have been able to create that sonic event for you. No amount of pre-concert lecture or program note could convey the same message that hearing the actual gunfire, police chatter, and crowd hysteria that took place that day. Music with electronics is important to our repertoire because it allows us to bring outside events into the concert hall, to perform in capacities that can engage with and be involved with real-world events here on stage. Music with electronics is also important because it allows us to perform repertoire that would otherwise be difficult, if not impossible, to perform. <laughs> as fun as it would have been to program a concerto for percussion ensemble and synthesizer, like James Nikus's Visions, the odds I'd be able to reach not only that instrumentation but the personnel to perform such a work are slim to none. And oftentimes, when composers write for unusual, large, but not quite full symphony large, or just, you know, more than a quintet instrumentations, we find this fantastic pile of music relegated to never being performed. And electronic music allows us to engage with those sonic worlds in ways that usually just get put in the folder of, oh, well, if I have a year to plan this music for 18 musicians, maybe, right? Um, music with electronics also forms a strong argument for an improved alternative to piano reductions. Uh, hot topic, I know. 
but uh, collaborative pianists pull a heavy load trying to imitate the harmonies, timbres, rhythms, pitches, sounds of entire symphony orchestras. And despite their hard work, they're always limited to the sonic plane of the piano, which oftentimes, through a composer's intentions, might leave a lot lost in translation. My personal favorite reason for performing music with electronics is that it also allows us to hear the impossible, multiple reverberations at once. There's not a concert hall or venue in the world that will let you hear dry and wet sounds at the same time because it defies the laws of physics, right? <laughs> but in the digital plane, anything goes. Because these various effects don't exist in nature, when we create sonic environments that utilize them, we create areas that our ears find uncomfortable, disorienting, and acoustically confusing, making them exist in a sound space whose input they don't know what to do with. Music with electronics asks you to hear sounds that you can't see being made, but sometimes it also asks you to hear sounds that you don't understand. The following work, Hildegard Westerkamp's Fantasy for Horns II, was originally written only for computer. However, the horn part was added in 1979 to enhance the sense of sonic soundscaping heard through the use of train, steam, and foghorns, which you'll hear coming through the four speakers surrounding you, as well as from myself. Hildegard Westerkamp plays, pays a lot of attention to the sonic world that you're about to experience, and I encourage you to listen carefully for not only where you hear sound coming from, but where you don't. This is Hildegard Westerkamp's Fantasy for Horns 2.
the absolutely most scariest part about playing music with electronics for most people is execution. It's the main reason that people don't perform works for fixed or interactive media, because we consider them complicated, too involved, or a little bit past our abilities, right? It's a huge misconception. The majority of pieces for electronics are written for fixed media, which is the most simple format it can be in. Every piece I've performed on thus far in the program has been for fixed media. Not the one that was playing when you came in, but all the ones I've played for Inchardon. <laughs> fixed media is a fancy term for a predetermined audio track, right? An MP3, a wave, anything that when you press start, it goes from start to finish the same way every single time you do it. Pretty simple. In works for fixed media, it's your job to line up your part with the accompaniment, but other than pressing play, the electronic part is incredibly hands-off. Now, there are a variety of different methods that you can use to line your part up with the electronic accompaniment, but the most common is just to listen. The majority of accompaniments will be highly metric, highly rhythmic, and frankly, just make a lot of sense to line your part up with. Um, alternatively, a composer may give you a, crick, a click track. In the, the case of a click track, the audience hears the accompaniment as you've been hearing, live and in real time, and the performer will hear the accompaniment plus a metronome in their ear. Now, you would do that through the use of an in-ear monitor, which are most commonly used by percussionists, but they're really not that complicated, and anybody can do them, and with some fancy routing and in a real big pinch, you can use a set of wired earbuds as an in-ear monitor. You don't need any fancy equipment to pull that off. For these simple pieces where you're listening to line up with the accompaniment, the most common form of notation is going to be standard sheet music, which you can see in Visions, right? Everything is metered, everything's metric, you've got your solo line and no other jargon, nothing to worry about. Part of why I have these scores up for you today is so that you can see exactly what I've been reading as I play these pieces, to dispel the myth that they're just so convoluted that you can't make sense of them, right? You can see it as I do it. Alternatively, another method that can be used to line up a fixed audio track with a solo part is through the use of a timeline. A timeline is what was on the Vesterkampf, as you can see at the bottom. I'll go, go over here. At the bottom, each page is divided into a minute, and you're given certain time markings for when different events happen. It's very straightforward. To perform pieces like this, you would use a stopwatch if you were paying attention. I wasn't taking selfies backstage. This is my stopwatch, right? You start the stopwatch at the beginning, or at a specified point in the piece, and from that point on, whenever you hit a metric marking, a minute or 15 seconds or whatever it is, it tells you to begin or end an event. This type of music is often notated in scores, as you can see, because it's just a lot easier to notate when other things come in and help you line up with what you hear. This also lends itself towards a lot of graphic notation. You can see the whoosh in there, just because how else are you going to notate a whoosh, right? It, it's pretty straightforward. It, it, graphic notation is in the same sonic world, or not the same sonic world, but the same realm of, oh, it's just too scary and too complicated. But in reality, it's very, very approachable if you give it the opportunity. The last of the main three types of accompaniments that you'll find in fixed media is through the use of soundscaping. Soundscaping is when the composer provides you with a track, and it's really just background noise, right? It's, it's an acoustic environment that you perform on top of. It doesn't engage with your part, it doesn't have anything to line up to, and for the most part, the only agreement between the composer and the performer is that you will end around or on when the track ends. And that's the exact format of the next piece on the program, Joanna Ross Hersey's 1112. This piece is in full graphic notation. You can go to the next one, as you can see. And the performer is instructed to wander anywhere through the map, with the only stipulation being they start and end at the main gate. This map is based off the covenant of Hildegard van Bingen. In this work, originally written for solo tuba and transcribed for horn by myself, the accompaniment is optional, but it's designed to enhance the meditative effect of meandering through this religious campus. This is Joanna Ross Hersey's 1112. I've got my own copy.
I've been keeping a secret from you. There is one part of electronic music that I have widely avoided mentioning thus far, and it's live and interactive electronics. Live and interactive electronics are different from fixed media because the accompaniment is generated as you go. Your rhythms, dynamics, articulations, pitches, wrong pitches if you play them, are all synthesized to create an accompaniment as you play the piece. In works for interactive media, a microphone will be running straight into your computer, either via USB or through the use of an interface, like I've got here. This is a big one. They do come in smaller sizes. <laughs> this captured sound is then sent to a software inside your computer in which it's analyzed, synthesized, and jumbled up into something else. The software that I'm using today is called Max, M-A-X, but other softwares you might run along run into along the way are Pure Data, VCV Rack, or Super Collider, just to name a couple. The processed audio, plus any additional elements the composer has added, are then routed out of your computer into the speakers for your audience to hear to create a performance where they hear not only their processed sound, fancy extras, but also the live acoustic performance of you, the soloist. Now, if we existed in this, this realm of effects over and over again for too long, it would get pretty boring, right? So the fun part is that music for interactive media tends to shift and move in between different phases of these effects. And we call these phases patches. Patches can either be fixed to a timeline and triggered to change after a certain meter marking. So just like we saw in the Vesterkamp, um, maybe after 15 seconds, it'll go to patch two, and 30 seconds later, it'll go to patch three. It's all automated. You perform with a stopwatch, and everything lines up beautifully. But as classical, music, classical musicians finally awaken to the 21st century, lots of us have these new fancy technologies called MIDI pedals. And it's becoming more and more commonplace for composers to write patches to be triggered live by the performer and sometimes a performing assistant. Thus far, my Bluetooth pedal has been turning pages on my iPad in Fourscore, like I'm sure all of you already know it's doing. But I just disconnected it. And reconnected it to my computer, where in this last piece on the program, Christopher Biggs' recombinant serenade, it will now trigger my computer to switch to new patches in the piece. Now, it's going to take me two or three minutes to set this up because I do have some moving parts. It's very simple, but a couple moving parts. So before I do that, I'd like to give a couple thank yous out. The first and biggest thank you has to go to my audio technicians, Matt and Natalie up in the booth. Please clap for them. Without them, nothing would have happened today. They, they have loaned me equipment, they have helped me troubleshoot, they got here at 1 p.m. to help me set up for a 4.30 recital, and they have been quintessential to the production you have witnessed today. My second thank you has to be to Professor Purvis. I pitched him about 19 lecture recitals that were all off the beaten path and definitely not the things I was allowed to do, and this is the one he caved on. So without him, this production wouldn't be here either. Thank you, Professor Purvis. And lastly, I'd like to thank my audience, anyone who's tuning in on the stream, as well as you who are all here in person today. I greatly appreciate not only your attendance, but your support, your interest in electronic music, and just for being my good friends. Thank you so much for being here. Give me just a couple minutes, and I will play the last piece in the program for you, Christopher Biggs' Recombinant Serenade.
Thank <laughs> you. 